So, we start with the idea of myth. Now, in the West, the oldest myth, of course, is the depicted the table myth, which I won't bother to describe to you because I'm sure you all know. If you don't know it, check it out in Genesis chapter 11. Um, I always find this a very pessimistic myth because it, from it you get the idea that translation is the result of a fall or a sin or a disaster or a, a leaving paradise in this wonderful state during which we can all talk to each other perfectly in the same language and we can all understand each other. And so I think this, is, this has had a huge influence on the way scholars in the West have thought of, have thought of translation as something second best. You know, lost in translation. Failure, never quite as good as you, you know all the cliches. It's very sad, very depressing, I think. Um, why is this doing this now? I'll, I'll just have to go next. All right, next. Okay. I'll have to get it a different way. This is a picture that many of you, many of you may know. One of the uh, visualizations of the great tower that then collapsed. Um, however, other proposals have been made. Um, in uh, the book edited by Susan Bassnitz and uh, Christopher Reilly here, um, there is a wonderful chapter at the end by Ganesh Devi, whom I don't know, <coughs> who proposes a quite different kind of myth, um, which he says uh, could be used, or has been used, I'm not quite sure of the status of it, it's a very short little essay, uh, a different way of thinking about translation, relating it to the myth of metapsychosis, the, the transmigration of souls. When you die, you come back again the next time, and if you, if you did well in the previous life, you come back as a princess, and if you did badly, you come back as a cabbage, or whatever it may be, <laughs> however it may have been. <coughs> um, forgive me if I'm uh, insulting anybody here. No cabbages present, I hope. No, no, no. All right. Um, now, th this, this, is, this is quite interesting, because uh, if you think of translation like this, then it has the potential to be very positive. The translation is a potential improvement. It's a sort of spiritual step up the ladder towards nirvana or something. Um, it's totally the opposite way of thinking um, from, from the previous one. And I think this difference, uh, I see a connection here with the discussion that we started yesterday. You may get a comment on this uh, when we get to the discussion stage about the, the West the West's um, fixation on, on, on the lost original uh, and the East's rather more relaxed idea about, okay, let's have another go, let me try again, let's do another version, and it's all much more positive, which I, I, I rather like. So, what's your myth? What's your metaphor? It's another question. <coughs> um, in my book, Memes of Translation, I comment on these six or seven or eight metaphors as being very typical ones in, uh, in our field. You, I'm sure, are familiar with them all, and you probably have many, many others. Cannibalism, and uh, making a bridge, and changing clothes, and performing a work of art, and a dozen, of other, a dozen other things I'm sure you, you are familiar with. There are loads and loads of metaphors of the foundation, of course. We can't manage without them. Um, when we are faced with something which is strange or mysterious, one of our first reactions is to say, well, what's it like? At least, is it like something which I'm, if I'm, more, which I'm more familiar with? Um, uh, and so it goes. <coughs> you needn't, I think, write all these down because you can get them later if, if, you, if, if you need to. Um, what's your metaphor then? <coughs> uh, in my first uh, translation theory, uh, lecture course with my own students uh, uh, every year, I ask this question and I walk around and I, I get some answers and they're always interesting and they're always a bit strange. <coughs> the strangest one I ever heard was somebody said that translation is like a cow. I, I always tell this uh, when I come to Setra because it's a good metaphor and nobody understands why translation is like a cow. I went to this student and I said, why do you say translation is like a cow? It's perfectly simple, she said. Cows eat good grass, and out the other end you get either shit or milk. <laughs> what, is, is that your image or not? What's your, what's your image? My metaphor, which I like, which is my, my perspective, is from Nemetis. <coughs> this is what, uh, this was the, the insight that 
was the basis of the book I wrote about 10 years ago. And it's still something which I find very interesting, a very productive and fruitful way to think about translation. It just happens to be the way I like to see it, because it allows me to compare, to, to put translation into the context of cultural evolution, like genetic evolution. And you can make all kinds of parallels there. If this is a new idea to you, there are several things on my own website which you can, with texts which you can, which you can read there, which you can explain this idea uh, a bit more. But there are problems with metaphors, of course, just like there are problems with myths. But if you choose a given metaphor or a given myth as your pair of spectacles, your perspective through which you see, through which you, uh, you make your theory, Remember, theory is looking at something, seeing it in a certain light. Well, nice quote from William Golding. I mean, we are the prisoners of, your, of our metaphors. Um, one of the risks, I think, of scholarship is that we get stuck with a particular metaphor. Recently, I read a fascinating article in the journal Prospects, which is an English social political journal, an, ar an article arguing that the way we think about genetics is wrong because we think of the human genome as a book with the DNA and the, all the other stuff. Don't tell ask me what all the details are, but we have this picture of a book with pages and chapters and letters and little DNA things holding on to each other in chains and we interpret them in terms of words and genes, etc. You know the idea. And he argues that this is the wrong metaphor because it does not allow us to see certain facts about the genome. It, it prevents us from seeing them all together. And he says that we should get rid of this metaphor. Now, maybe also in translation studies, there are metaphors that have no longer any, that, that now are, are, are they, they cost more than they give. I won't take any examples, but it's a point that you may want to think about. Are, are the metaphors that we use to think about translation, are they still good ones? Can we imagine using other metaphors? It's a good mental exercise to try to think of alternative metaphors, shadow metaphors, if you like, which you could have used but didn't. This is the positive side. I think that's a, a wonderful quotation. Metaphor is one of our most important tools for trying to comprehend partially what cannot be comprehended totally. Okay. Now we move to models. <coughs> um, here I think we can be fairly clear because I think there is a rather limited number of kinds of model which are used in translation studies. I think in fact that there are three kinds of model. And one of the questions I ask my own students to consider is, well, what's your model going to be? What's your model going to be? And within that model, what particular uh, theory or framework do you want to use. My first kind of model is a comparative model, which is quite simply a model which is based on two sets of texts, and you compare them. There's a source text and a target text, or maybe more than one text on each side. Or there's a target text and a comparable text. So you have translations into English compared with non-translations into English, which are already in English in the first place. I, you can call them comparable texts or non-translated texts, if you like. And this, of course, is, is, the, uh, is the path taken by a great deal of corpus research these days from Mona Baker and Congress. Uh, you can also compare translation to other translations, which is also what's done in corpus research. You look for the translation universals, etc. And I think you can also compare translations to learner texts, that is to say, texts which are produced by non-native speakers or bilinguals, because you find things in translation which are very similar to things in texts produced by non-native speakers, suggesting that so-called translation universals may not be particular to translation, but maybe they are more general when we move towards unification. Here are some examples of uh, these comparative models based on two sorts of texts. I'm sure these are familiar to everybody in this room, so I don't suppose I need to say anything about them at all. This is just to show you what I mean. Again, don't write everything down if you're getting tired. You can pick up perhaps the paper copy later if you need to do it in copy. 
Then there are process models, second kind of model. Um, <coughs> process models could be sociological, a bit like this. A very simple model. This one comes from uh, Juan Sager, actually. Um, who, the idea that the translation takes place in four stages. Um, very simple. Uh, NIDA's model is a process model in a way, crossing the bridge. You remember the three stages. Uh, then there are models of um, processes which are supposed to be cognitive. The black box, you know, in, out, whatever, uh, and so on. Okay, so it's, a, it's another kind of model. And here are some examples of those. NIDA's work, Sega's work, Nord's looping model, where you keep going back to the Scopos to check whether you're in working with the stop loss okay and so on. Lots of think aloud protocol research, um, <coughs> working procedures, and perhaps also work in translation history, which of course looks at the, uh, the staging on quite a different time scale, but it's still often a process model. For example, uh, in fact, your lecture yesterday was a kind of uh, version of you know, before the British came, we had this and this, and then we had this and this, and then, of course, one can begin to say, well, why? When I mean, you're moving out of the process model into the causal model. Uh, the causal model, I think, is the most interesting and the most complicated. Um, this is, a, of course, a very simple picture of it. In fact, that, it probably doesn't look like that at all, but I think we have to start somewhere. Um, I like this picture, though, because it shows that there are different things that we can ask why about. If you start in the middle, and you say, well, here are some translations. Jeez, they're a bit funny. I wonder why we've got this and this and this in here. Well, the way you can answer why is to go back <coughs> and look at the causal conditions. See what you can find. See if you can find a connection. But your starting point might not be translations. Your starting point might be the effects of a translation. I show you something and you say, you smile. Or I show you a translation and you go and buy a bar of chocolate immediately. Or I show you a translation, you, you become a Muslim, or whatever it might be. Okay? Um, translations have effects. You might say, I'm not going to pay for that. You are the customer. I'm not paying for that. It's terrible. Or you might say, great, first prize. It's brilliant. Whatever the reaction might be. Translations cause effects. They're not, not simply the consequences of something that's happening before them. They themselves cause effects. And some, people, some research projects start precisely with effects, and then they go back and see to what extent they can find causes for these effects inside the translations. So all these theories, I think, Scopos theory, relevance theory, norm theory, these are all causal. And there are several examples there of causal kinds of research. Um, some tap research is like that. All quality assessment is causal. Quality assessments are reactions. The translation has an effect on you or on somebody, on a reader, uh, and you react to it. Machine translation research actually is causal because you are constantly trying to work out if I do this in the program, what happens out, what does the machine do with this and this. Constantly looking at causes and effects, and so on. Our next type, the fourth type, was the idea of a hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> for some people, for example, Popper, this is an idea that comes from him, the way I now am going to phrase it, um, a theory is a hypothesis. Um, Popper's model of scientific progress looks like that. You start with a problem question. If any of you come to a tutorial, probably one of the questions I should say, what's your problem? Or what's your research question? Or what's your starting point? Um, and then, according to Popper, somebody proposes some kind of tentative theory or a hypothesis. You know, uh, that, this is the answer to the problem, I think. Let's go and check it out. And then you go and test it. You eliminate the errors and you test your hypothesis. And usually what happens is, you know, oh geez, we've got another problem. And so it goes. So it's a constant process of problem, solution, testing, problem, and so on, and so on, so on. This is Popper's vision, which I quite like. It's a rather idealistic vision of science, perhaps, 
Popper has been criticised for not paying enough attention to the social circumstances and so on. But that would be another lecture. I won't go into that now. I like this quotation too, of the, uh, concerning the importance of, of the hypothesis as an, as an invention. It's perhaps worth remembering that a hypothesis is something which, in, the, in terms of human history, is quite new. We haven't had the concept of a hypothesis for more than about three or four hundred years. It, 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 it arrives with the beginnings of what we now call modern science. Um, in the West, anyway. Again, again, I'm ignorant of what its status may have been in the East, but it's a fairly important concept because it replaces the idea of X is true because somebody says so with the idea that X might be true, but let's go and check it out. It is a whole different way of thinking. I quite like that. This is my definition of what a hypothesis actually is. Um, that seems to me to be um, a fairly simple definition, but it makes sense to me. If anybody can offer a better one, I'm happy to improve it. It's an educated guess. It's not just intuition, then. It's a, a guess based on the best possible evidence available. It's a rational guess, you might think, uh, you, you, you might say. Uh, hypotheses have to be justified as well as tested. Popper has been criticized for not paying enough attention to the justification process of hypotheses, actually. Hypotheses come from somewhere. They have a basis somewhere, in previous theory, previous research, whatever it might be. I also think it's quite helpful to think of the different sorts of hypotheses. This is something I've written about in more detail in, in the book which we wrote with Jenny Williams called The Map, which is a, a kind of introductory guide to do with doing research in translation studies. There must be a copy in the library here, I should think, upstairs. Um, this is uh, fairly standard, except that there are debates about the last one. Um, descriptive hypotheses, explanatory hypotheses, and predictive hypotheses are standard in all the natural sciences, the hard sciences. Um, so a descriptive hypothesis is a claim which has that kind of form that all X, or all examples of X, have a certain feature. It's a universal claim. Or that all examples of this belong to a certain class. That's descriptive. Explanatory, well that's obvious. Predictive is also, I think, obvious. That's the basic form of it, if you can state the conditions. Uh, either X will occur or X will occur with a certain probability. Nowadays, we should perhaps add probability to every single prediction that we make, which is not deterministic necessarily. <coughs> and finally, the interpretive hypothesis, which is really one way of seeing the standard way of uh, using hypotheses in the humanities very often, in literary research and so on. How do we interpret something? Somebody makes a proposal that such and such is a useful interpretation. I'll have a few more things to say about that in just a moment, but I'll give you a few examples first to make sure that you get the idea. Um, examples of descriptive hypotheses are more or less any universal you can think of, any supposed potential translation universal. You know, I'm sure, the expeditation hypothesis, right? Um, Notice it needs to be interpreted. It's not obvious what explicitation means. Different scholars interpret it in different ways. All hypotheses somewhere are based on an interpretation. That's why I think that an interpretive hypothesis is a very important concept. Um, it might not be true. 